Nature's Archive Podcast, a Jumpstart Nature production. Hello, I'm Michael Hawk, and this is Nature's Archive. Each episode, I strive to bring you the very best guests to help us deepen our understanding of nature. I produce the podcast as a personal passion, so if you enjoy it, will you please consider subscribing, rating, and sharing this episode? It really does help. You can also support me on Patreon for as little as $5 a month. With that support, you can get extras, previews, access to ask questions of my guests, stickers, and more. Check out patreon.com slash nature's archive. Now on to the show. Not consume Amazon within an hour of this podcast. Warning, listen to this episode at your own risk. If you aren't careful, you may find yourself out a few hundred dollars. Why? Today we're talking about field guides. You know, the books and apps that help you identify, find, and learn about all kinds of amazing creatures. And if you aren't careful, you may just want to buy some of the ones that we speak about. There are so many amazing field guides out there, artistic, informative, innovative, and in some cases, maybe even slightly irreverent. And with deep and diverse nature interests, my guests are perfect for the topic. Joining me are Alan Fish, who works at the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy as director of the Raptor Observatory and as associate director of community science, and also Cricket Raspit of the California Academy of Sciences. You might recognize Cricket from last year's surprise hit episode on dock fouling, or the art of finding unique marine creatures on floating docks. Today we start with a lively discussion of our first field guides, which transitions into a short dissection of the nomenclature of field guides, identification guides, and natural history guides. Ultimately, we decided that they'd all be on the table. We began by discussing a number of familiar bird guides, but we quickly transitioned into all sorts of other interesting guides, everything from bumblebees to fungi to plant galls to lichen to even desert holes. We also discuss apps and other technology that can assist, or dare I say, replace physical field guides. And that's just the start. In fact, we didn't have time to cover everything in our stacks of favorites. So please follow my blog at podcast.naturesarchive.com or follow me on Instagram at Nature's Archive, and I'll profile a few additional guides that Cricket, Allen, and I love. Be sure to follow Cricket at Chili Possum on Instagram and iNaturalist, and check out Allen's organization, Golden Gate Raptor Observatory, at Golden Gate Raptors on Instagram or at ggro.org. And as always, I have links to everything that we talked about today in the show notes at podcast.naturesarchive.com. So without further delay, our discussion about field guides. Cricket and Alan, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's great. So this is going to be a really fun one, talking about one of my favorite subjects, field guides. As I was preparing for this episode, I really started to gain a greater appreciation for how nuanced and complicated field guides are, how many different variations there are. There's almost uh, an entire taxonomy of field guides that we could talk about. So uh, it's going to be an interesting one, and we'll see how much we can pack into the time we have today. So with that, Cricket, can you give a short introduction? Yeah. So my name is Cricket Raspit. I'm a curatorial assistant at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, and I work in the ornithology and mammalogy department. So I think that gives a hint at the broad diversity of knowledge and taxonomical spaces that you work in. I'm around a lot of nature people, for sure. And people might remember you from an episode that we did last year on dock fouling. Yes, that was me. And Alan, uh, this is your first appearance on Nature's Archive, so welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I am the director of the Golden Gate Raptor Observatory, which is part of the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, the Friends Organization at the GGNRA, the parklands all around San Francisco. I have commented here before how so many of my guests at one time or another have either volunteered with or worked for the Golden Gate Raptor Observatory. So it's nice to actually have the the current director. (laughs) So thank you for being here. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm guilty of that as well. I'm a volunteer bander with a GGRO too. I always love to hear from people that I talk to how they got interested in nature in the first place. And I guess in this situation, maybe more from the slant of field guides. Alan, can you tell me a bit about your introduction to nature and field guides? I would have to say I was fortunate to be surrounded by a few relatives, my grandmother specifically, who was a botanical painter and had a few classic old field guides around when I was a kid growing up. And it was clear to me these were some kind of portal to an exciting place. When I was seven, the other grandparents gave me my first golden guide to birds. And I spent hours looking through that thing, just stunned by the colors and knew a handful of birds in the area I grew up in California, down the South Bay, but really just absorbed those pages like 
they were water and I was thirsty. Alan, I understand that you also have another early field guide story that you wanted to share. Just because it, it puts me in such a, an incredibly good light of being a, an astute bird watcher. But to that golden guide, the classic golden guide from the mid-1960s by Robbins, also known as Robbins by Chandler Robbins, it was one of the first field guides that I found that had a checklist in the back. You could go through the index and check off all the birds you had seen. So I got it when I was about seven. By the time I was about nine or 10, I realized that I had been a nature kid for a long time and that I had probably seen all of the birds that were listed as common. So common tern, common loon. In those days, it was called the common barn owl. A, a lot of the common birds, just clearly I had seen. So I, knowing perfectly well what the word common meant, went through the back of my field guide and I checked all those off with India ink so it was permanent. A few years later, about 12, 13, I, I realized that I had in no way seen a common loon. I'd never been anywhere near a common loon, nor any of those common species. So I lived for a few months of shame and guilt without telling anybody and then realized that I obviously had to tear the back pages out of my golden guide. So to this day, my golden guide is lacking the last 20 pages of index. And I learned to live a more honest life, let's say. To this day. So you still have that golden guide. I absolutely do. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. awesome. All right. And Cricket, what was your introduction to the world of field guides? So I also had a botanical grandmother. So my grandma was a botanist and my grandfather studied bird flight behavior. And they were also academics, very bookish. So they passed that to my dad. So we always had a ton of books in the house. And I grew up in the suburbs of Southern California. So it wasn't nature wonderland. So a lot of the times that kind of scratch my nature itch, I went to books. So we had all kinds of field books and big glossy art books, Audubon books, and lots of National Geographics. But specifically the field guides we had, we were talking about early field guides, my dad had this book called The Field Book of Natural History. It was published in 1949, and it was a compendium of all nature. So there were cultivated plants birds and slime molds and marine organisms, like just everything. I think it was this kind of last gasp of Victorian naturalists that you could know everything in the natural world, but it had these beautiful line drawings and it was so exciting because it was all of these, it was, there was a huge potential for things to find. I wasn't seeing any of these things. I wasn't a field guy in that sense. I could go out and find and it, all of these strange organisms, but it was like Alan said, it was a portal. It gave me the idea that there was more out there than just what I was seeing. And it was findable. It was a field guide. Someone had seen it in the field. Yeah, that sounds like an amazing book. And it reminds me as to why in this digital age, why I still love field guides so much, because they're sort of a symbol of what's possible. You said that you could look at it and you knew it was findable. And when you see all of these organisms, depending on what the field guide is covering, in one place compared with maps, it really gives you a sense of inspiration that, yeah, I could go see that someday. Right. You know, maybe I'll get to experience that. And I also grew up with the golden guide. That was the field guide, the bird field guide that I had when I was a kid. And I'm really happy that I learned to bird with a field guide, with a physical field guide, because, and I'm sure you guys had the same experience where you'd spend so much time with a field guide, just browsing and looking through it, that you'd go out into the field and you'd be able to identify a bird you didn't know that you knew. You know, it would just come to you in a flash like, oh, I know that. Because you'd seen it, you'd just absorb it by that physical act of flipping through the pages and looking at the plates and looking at all the details. There's a lot more knowledge that you get just from physically using a field guide than a more directed search that you might get online or, you know, on an app. My first field guide was also the golden guide to North American birds. It was probably like an early eighties edition and it really wasn't mine. It was my parents or my dad's. I'm not quite sure, but I always found it to be odd that they had it in the first place because they weren't, they liked to go on hikes, but that was the extent of it. Yet we had this field guide to birds and I know that my dad used to enjoy looking at it and that's actually how the guide met its demise he was browsing it while taking a bath <laughs> <No>. <laughs> one evening. Yeah. That's classic. Yeah. And it fell into the bath and they replaced it to my surprise. They replaced it with the National Geographic Guide to North American Birds. I forget the exact title, but, but yeah, another amazing guide. And I think uh, personally, I didn't purchase my first field guide till 
several years later, 1998 or so, and it was the National Geographic Guide to Birds again. So I think before we go too much deeper, it's maybe worth just talking about what is a field guide. As I alluded to at the beginning, in trying to think logically about this topic today, I realize that there are identification guides, there are location-centric guides, there's uh, things called field guides, but they're more like encyclopedias. You, You could never really take it into the field. So maybe we should give our own definitions of, of what we think a field guide is in the first place. So uh, Cricket, do you, do you want to go take that big topic? Yeah, I think it is a pretty amorphous category. I think generally it's a guide to what you can see and find in the field. So that sounds redundant, that the information tends to be stripped down to information that would help with ID. So there's not a lot of biology or ecology necessarily, unless that helps. It's a sort of distillation of all of the pertinent information that you need to identify something when you are out in the field. So sometimes that's location information. Sometimes that's because we're visual creatures, primarily visual. Generally, it should be a size that you can take in the field, but it doesn't necessarily have to be something that you take in the field. I consider anything a field book that's a pattern recognition guide. So a pattern training system. So anything that trains the brain to recognize organisms in the field so that you can install that pattern in your brain so that you know it when you see it. That's not a very concise definition, but that's my working one. If it's a tool for training my brain to recognizing things, whether or not I have it in my hand in the field, I consider it a field guide. So then I I have to ask a question. Do you own any of the Crossley ID guides? I don't. I probably should. I was thinking a lot about Crossley as we were preparing to record this. I think it's an amazing system and I think it's great, but I don't actually own it. And yeah, for as immense as my field guide collection is, I don't own any either. Oh no! Uh, yeah, I know. I so it's a big gap that I have. But I saw Alan. You were holding yeah, one. Yeah, Alan up. has it right there. Yeah. So Alan, tell us about the Crossley guide. Can I tell you my love hate relationship with the Crossley guide? <laughs> yeah. Certainly. So the Crossley guides are were put together by a very prominent East Coast bird guy, uh, Richard Crossley, who's a Brit but hangs out around Cape May, New Jersey, one of the great raptor migration, bird migration spots in the world. And he did something no one else really had done as effectively. He put together big screen, double page spreads of photoshopped bird images on one page. So you're looking, let's say, at a pasture um, with a little fence, and there's about 60 American kestrels. And they're in every shape and form. So when the Crossing Guide came out, my first response to it was, this is a lie. Who's ever going to walk into a pasture and see 60 kestrels? That maybe has happened a few times in history, but it basically sets people up for imagery that really doesn't happen, at least in, in birdland. And unless you're looking at flocks of sparrows or shorebirds or something that's numerous for sure. The raptor guide came out sometime maybe five years ago, and Crossley did something very clever to bring me in the story, which is he hired Jerry Liguori and Brian Sullivan to do the text. And both of those guys, just brilliant raptor naturalists, biologists, and top of their game. And I would have bought any book those two had co-authored. So that kind of warmed me up a little bit. But I still didn't like that people might think they would be out on a mountainside and would see 14 golden eagles at once, unless they were at a golden eagle migration site, which is there's very few of them. The thing I do like about Crossley, and I'm starting to warm up now to the whole process, is the thing that I miss in a lot of field guides is variation, is really variation of the theme. And being both a nature boy, but also a a raptor specialist, I'm really aware that there's 60 different kinds of red-tailed hawks in terms of plumage and light morphs and dark morphs and subspecies and choose second years and adults. So once you start looking at all those, the two or three three red-tailed hawks in my old golden guide from childhood just do not do the job. So Crossley's done something wonderful, which is handed off a bunch of photos showing variation on the kestrel theme so that we can see a bunch of different kestrels and try and apply the bird that we just saw or are looking at to that possibility. Yeah, I guess I'm going out on a limb since I don't own one of his guides. (laughs) But as I understand it, one of his goals is to 
tie into some of the triggers that we have in the visual recognition system in our brain, where the context of the situation is really important. So he gives you the context, and that goes back to what Cricket was saying about pattern recognition. So it's, it's an interesting thing, and I'm curious if you've either of you have heard anyone pointing to that, pointing to that layout in the Crossley Guide as, as being helpful by uh, having given that context beyond just the variation. I don't know. I, I think it's an interesting turn for field guides because I feel like most field guides, and maybe the Sibley is the best example of this, are about the platonic ideal of a bird, which is why a lot of the, I feel like a lot of the field guides that use photographs aren't necessarily as useful or they just don't click as well because a Sibley illustration of an orange crown warbler is a distillation of all of the orange crown warblers that he's seen and filtered through a translation to create almost the ideal orange crown warbler as seen by a human, right? Not through the lens of a camera. And it's all out of context, right? The classic field guide is a white background or like the Peterson, sometimes it's gray or greenish, but it's usually a neutral color, a blank color. So bringing back the context is a really interesting idea, but I'm not sure how well all of us who have been trained on that platonic type of field guide can translate that information. Like context is cool, but I'm not sure that it's the best way to train the brain for patterns. I don't know. This is probably a lead into a topic in and of itself, and that's photos versus illustrations. And one of the nice things about what Sibley does, or what a lot of these traditional field guides do, by using illustrations, not only can they show this abstract version of what you might see in the field, but they can show the same poses, and you can compare very easily that way from bird right. to bird. And with photos, it's really hard to get the birds to pose for you, and then you're dealing with different lighting and all sorts of other variances that come into play. There's danger in that, though, too, and I can think of I'll, I'll just say that the, the most recent version, still about 20 years old, of the Peterson Guide to North American Raptors, the painter, he messed up on some of the forms. And, and so the shapes are enough off that for someone who's keyed into shape is a really critical thing. And one of the things that obviously we could talk about is some people are really color focused. Some people are really shape focused. Some people are really pattern focused. And sometimes those three people are standing shoulder to shoulder looking at the same bird patting the elephant from a different angle or a different sort of mental point of view. But paintings, I, I have to say, I like the mix. I like the mix of photos and, and paintings working together. And I do agree that if I were on a desert island, I'd rather have the paintings, but I'd want the paintings done really well. And David Sibley definitely set a high watermark for that. Other painters, even recent ones, not as much. And something to, to be a little skeptical and a little watchful about because I think it, it, focusing on the subtleties of raptor shapes are really important. And of course, depending on whether the bird is gliding or stooping or soaring or leaving a branch or landing with full breaking of all those feathers pulled out or stretched out can be a really different looking bird in different ways. So there are some subtle differences there. I apologize. You said the feathers pulled out and I was like, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, that's a totally different style of guide. Actually, uh, one of the guides I was looking at this morning is the is called Bird Feathers, which is a I think has been amazingly under um, appreciated. But many of the people who come to me with bird questions are often holding a feather, saying, "What is this?" Yeah, I usually use the Feather Atlas. Maybe that's one example of a good online field guide is the mm -hmm. Feather. Yeah, because that's a really useful tool. And it's just in the form of a field guide. But as far as I know, it's only available online. There is a book version called, called The Bird Feathers by Scott and McFarland. That's, of course, not as comprehensive. That's the beauty of the online stuff is it can be added to and modified and grown without buying another copy of the book. Yeah. So my background has been in computer engineering and tech. And one of the things I'm always thinking about when it comes to trade-offs when making design decisions or uh, most decisions for that matter is the velocity trade-off. Like how fast can you get new information out to the world? With, with photos, for example, you can usually create a field guide much more quickly than with illustrations. Right. You pointed to the fact how difficult a good il illustration is. And, and it's an interesting trade-off to consider because I would like to see 
say, a field guide to surfage of the West or something like that. And I can't imagine how long it would take for a good <laughs> illustrator to create something yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good point, too, is that the subject matter really does make a difference in terms of that. For someone to have a life's project of painting every North American bird is difficult, but possible for one person to do. Either you'd have to have a lot of contractors out there all painting surfid flies, or maybe I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but talking about the plant galls field guide, it works to have photographs. Because like you said, you can't have someone paint every single one that would just make it, in terms of the economics of field guides, you couldn't do it. It would just be too expensive. So for that, the photos are useful and it's more functional. And I think that also plays into the art of the field guide. I enjoy looking at the beautiful paintings in painted field guides. It's a lot of artistry and those tend to be like the named ones, right? Like Sibley or you know Peterson, they have their name on them. They're also the author illustrator, which I think makes a difference when you're doing the whole thing together. But I love the physical object of a beautifully produced field guide that has been painted by a human hand. Maybe that's my art history background talking. I totally agree with you. And I, I think you touched two chords for me. One was there was something funny that happened when the Sibley Guide came out. And notice we call it the Sibley Guide. We don't call it field guide because it weighs over a kilogram. It's huge. And it tests whether or not that should be called a field guide. And the Sibley people were smart enough to break it into a small Eastern field guide and a smaller Western field guide that I think are right in there with the National Geographic and Peterson guides and stuff, so it works. But what I love is that immediately after the Sibley guide came out, I started hearing people talk about getting my Sibley or getting my Robins or getting... And and field guides became not so much a field guide to Western birds, but... I'm going to go get my Peterson and look that up. Right. And not only was it, it not a field guide, it was my, it was possessive <laughs> that you would own this, which kind of cracks me up and funny how we do that. But I, I, the gall idea of photos, I've been working on lichens recently and I, the lichen, the, the lichens, gosh, what is it? Western North America, oh, lichens of California. Yeah. Wonderful book, gorgeous photos incredible labor of love. And I so wish there were painted illustrations next to it. Partly so I could see what, the, there's a whole lichen nomenclature for parts of a lichen. And maybe I just need to sit down and learn those 83 words. But <laughs> I really wish each new genus that I'm learning had at least a illustrated version that showed me what those things were and why a Pycnopedia was different from something else. They're just, they're, they're such indulgent words. And I think it is valuable to use some of those jargonistic words, but it's also really good to open the world up to a bigger public that are never going to learn all of the 23 words for hairiness that (laughs) botanists have imposed on these species. Yeah. And that's another thing about illustrations, particularly for something like lichens. I feel like illustrations do a much better job of conveying structure that there's something about the way that you can use shadow and the way that it can be isolated from the background that's much better at showing structure for something like a lichen where structure is really important. Hey, it's Michael here. Have you ever thought about creating a nature podcast for a mission-driven organization? Would you like to work with other nature communicators and conservationists like Griff Griffith and myself? Well, Jumpstart Nature is looking for volunteers to help with editing and production for both Nature's Archive and the Jumpstart Nature podcast. We have details of this and other volunteer opportunities, which range from content creation, social media coordination, website development, and more, all on jumpstartnature.com. Oh, and one more thing. We now also have Nature's Archive merch. It's on the Jumpstart Nature store, so check out the store link on naturesarchive.com or on jumpstartnature.com. So speaking of the artistic value, going back to that, theme anyway. Have you purchased a field guide just for the artistic beauty? For sure. (laughs) Botanical illustration has such a long history and so many good practitioners. And so I've bought books on plants that I probably will never use and don't really care about because the illustrations are very beautiful. Even if some of the technical illustrations are very beautiful. But there are a few, like the John Muir Laws. So that was in my little favorite pile. So his illustrations especially are a little bit impressionistic. They're not highly technical, but they're incredibly beautiful. They give you a real good feeling for the creatures. 
I, in general, the more specific the subject matter, the better I like a field guide or and the more useful I think it's going to be. I tend not to buy the ones that are the wildlife of various region because they tend to be almost a little bit too broad to be that useful. But the laws field guide to the Sierra Nevada, I think is really beautiful. And that's something that I might waste some backpack space on if I was going back country and didn't have any cell phone service or iNet or anything. So yes, that one was one I bought primarily for the illustrations, but it actually turns out to be a good field guide. Can we just geek out on Jack Laws for a minute? Go for it. Absolutely. (laughs) Jack is a local Bay Area kid, and I can't say kid, we're the same age, I think. But what he did was incredible. He did a bird version of the Jack Laws Guide to the Sierra Nevada Plants and Animals of the Sierra Nevada. Forget plants and animals. He's got poop in there. (laughs) He's got stars in there. He's done an amazing job to distill that. I actually consider it a personal challenge, and I've told him this that I would find species in the Sierra Nevada that he did not have in there. (laughs) And I've only found one in about 10, 15 years now. And I don't even remember what it was at this point because it was pure ego, you know, driven. (laughs) It wasn't driven by the animal, but his ability, I'm not terrific at bugs and insects, but his ability to get this sort of top 10% of plants and bugs and things that there would be hundreds and hundreds of species in the Sierra Nevada was just awesome. And it really shows a deep connection that he has, lifelong connection to the Sierra Nevada species. And I was very skeptical that someone could put all that into one backpack-sized book and capture so much. But I think he opened up a really wonderful world for a whole lot of people that hadn't really appreciated field guides or gotten deep into species identification yet. So bravo, Jack wherever you are. (laughs) It's a beautiful book. And I think that's also one of the reasons I tend not to buy those visitor center gift shop wildlife of this area books is they tend to like often they'll only put the most charismatic organisms that you might see. So they'll have, I don't know, like a grizzly bear and maybe some kind of snake or something. But what I like about the laws field guide is that it is the most common things you'll see, whether they're very spectacular organisms or not. So there is a kind of general field guide that's useful if it actually illustrates the most common things you'll see. It ties back to what you're saying about how that might actually be a book you would take backpacking with you. And I could just see sitting down in the evening, you know, heating up your freeze-dried dinner on your back, backpacking <laughs> trip. And then there's yeah. this like tussock moth that's going by and that's going to be in that book. So it sort right. of makes sense. And there is also that sort of, we were talking about earlier, that sort of iterative way of learning with field guides is you might be sitting around camp and thumbing through the book and see something and you're like, oh, I didn't even know that was a thing. Maybe I should look out for that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And then you might see it because now it's a possibility. And I I don't want to make this all about California, but we are all in California. So I guess we tend to think this way, but we're so lucky to have not only Jack Laws, but Obi Kaufman create some interesting guides as well that are also uh, unique and artistic and a uh, different slant, a different view on nature and interconnectedness. I've been late to warm up to Obi Kaufman's work, and I'll just be honest about that. Obi, if you're out there, I love you now, but I, I didn't at first. And I think because for me, it was, they're so dense and they're packaged like a field guide, right? They're, they're that small size, little white books, but they're actually quite beautifully, artistically beautiful. They really are reference guides. And The Coastal Guide that just came out, I picked up a few days ago at a bookstore in Berkeley, and I was feeling a little like skeptical and arrogant. And I opened it up and I was completely absorbed in whatever that page was. And then I was just stuck. And I went from, I'm not quite sure what to do with this, but I really asked, it's a crack it open and just read. So I wouldn't call it a field guide so much, although his paintings are absolutely worthy of that. And I think he, in some ways, we're talking toward the future of field guides. Obi seems to be doing something, launching from Jack's work of saying, here is a geography that's magnificent. And let me share why. And and connecting between hydrology and geology and plant life and animal life and human patterns um, that are a really wonderful way to introduce broad systems to people on a personal way. Bravo. Obi Kaufman, I'm behind you now. <laughs> and, and you've re- revealed a bias I have. When I was thinking about some of my favorite field guides, a common theme I noticed, 
And I wasn't considering Obi Kaufman's work to be a field guide per se, but I did have a theme of picking the guides that had more ecology and more natural history in them, which kind of goes against maybe what you would necessarily require in the field to identify something. But I, I really enjoy that. I think that's why I have gotten so deep into nature over the years is I like trying to understand why things are there and how they interconnect. So I had the same experience with Obi Kaufman's work where just seeing that sort of absorption in the environment really spoke to me. Right. Well, that's the interesting thing too with field guides and where a field guide shades into a reference book. I feel like there's two competing purposes to a field guide or one, two competing impulses. One is the impulse to simplify. So you, the more you simplify, the easier the pattern recognition. So you take this very complex subject like galls or manzanita or marine organisms and you distill it into a consumable size, right? This is, you go outside and you look at all the plants and it's overwhelming. But if you distill it and you organize it and you translate it, then it's usable. It's knowable. But then you also want to complicate things. So you want to simplify things in order for people to be able to identify things. But then you also want to convey some of the complexity of the ecology. You want to lead people into knowing more about a system, more about an oak savanna or more about tide pools. But you have to do that by simplifying first and then opening it up. So those competing impulses are really interesting. Some field guides, you'll, a reference guide you look at, for I don't know, can you imagine a surfeit fly one? There would be so much information there that it's almost a little overwhelming. So you need this portal, this sort of simplified portal for people to get in, and then you can open it up with the ecology. So that's a really interesting balance to strike, though, in a field guide. How complicated do you make it? How much of that information do you put in there? And I don't think I'm going out on a limb to say that most people, their first field guide is usually a bird field guide. They're, I think, the highest selling, most popular. In the United States or in Europe or Australia, we all have somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, 800 to 1,000 species of birds. And that might sound like a lot, but it's a manageable number. And it's not quite so complicated as many other taxa. The subject really drives a lot of how much simplification you can do and how much you have to do out of necessity, like a, a field guide to beetles of the world. Uh, not possible. <laughs> That's interesting. I've been lucky enough the last during COVID, one of the Parks Conservancy's great projects is a bee survey of the GGNRA and Tamil Pius area. And a wonderful bee biologist, originally from UC Berkeley, Sarah Leon Guerrero, who's been working out of our building. And just incredible to see her work on bee samples. And she'll run in with this incredible blue jeweled thing the size of a grain of rice and show me. It's just incredibly beautiful. And she'll say it's this genus and I'm a bird person. I'm waiting for the species name. And she says, no, genus is important. And that's what you get. And, and it's working on bees, working on so many insects. Family is often, you're going to just be stuck at family, but it's really interesting to my birding mentality for just getting a good genus name is a really exciting moment in, yeah. in discovery. And I, and Sarah really taught me that. I really appreciate that. And I've been cranking on dragonflies the last few years, just completely in awe and in love with dragonflies. And finding that genus again is, genus is pretty good. I can get to genus. Species, some areas, some not. There's an incredibly wonderful California procentric guide by Kathy Biggs. And Kathy has Sonoma based, has launched a lot of dragonfly people. And it's great because it's, it is really distilled, has a little bit of ecology, a little bit of range, but really distills down to the animal and how to identify it and complemented really well by digital website media that she has with a kind of, again, back to the portal idea that she has the portal to various references so that you can dig wider into the natural history and ecology and conservation biology and things like that, but really appreciate getting to explore a whole new area from a beginner's mind, which is super useful for even going back to birds and seeing them differently. Also, I feel like if you're a person who started with vertebrates and moves into invertebrates, it's like the Wizard of Oz. Like it's just, you come out the other side and there's just so many colors and so many possibilities and so much unknown which is difficult sometimes. That's also the field guide thing, right? There's a sense that it's codified knowledge, it's knowable, it's in a book. Someone's 
spent their time studying this and writing it down for you. But there's still a lot that's not knowable. And I think this is where the digital resources come in, where you can have what you know in a book, but then you can also have all these additional resources of research that's currently being done. Or like you said, with variation, if you want to see every kind of red tail, you can go online and see every kind of red tail. And so maybe there can be more linkage between that. Maybe a note in your field guide that says, this species is highly variable. To see all of the color morphs, here's a link or here's a resource that you can use. And 20 years ago, if you had asked me to find a, a coleopterist to identify the beetle that I had just found, I would have been out of luck. I, maybe there was a USDA lab in Berkeley that might have had that opportunity and but there might be three or four beetle experts across the country that deal with the family for the beetle that I just found. Bugguide.net and INAT, what, what incredible opportunities now that we have to put our lousy little iPhone photos online. And, and two or three weeks later, it's like Christmas when some really intelligent taxonomist across the country or across the world figures out what your beetle was. It's it's a thrilling time for learning invertebrate species. Really? I can't believe it took this long for iNaturalist to come. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a whole program right by itself. It's an incredible phenomenon that our iNat colleagues put together for us. I definitely want to talk about some digital resources, digital field guides, or field guide adjacent topics as well. But before we stray too far away from traditional bound paper <laughs> guides, I wanted maybe to talk about some of the, like, Cricket, you mentioned the the Gall field guide, G-A-L-L. -L. I think I sometimes make it sound like Gall, G-U-L-L. -L. Yeah, that's a, I, that's a common mishearing. I, I always have to explain that. So tell me about that guide and, and why you had it sitting next to you here for this discussion. Okay, I have it sitting next to me in my favorite field guides pile because I think it's also an archetypal example of how the effects that a field guide can have. It's the Plant Galls of the Western United States by Ronald Russo. And it's all of the sort of insect generated galls on plants. And it's just a really comprehensive guide and it's got beautiful photos. And I think it, it was an example of collating all of this information that had been either scattered or inaccessible into one book that you could easily take into the field and was really useful to use in the field. And you could tell, for example, watching on INET, the effect that its publication had, because all of a sudden everybody was seeing gulls everywhere. And there was a gull week on iNaturalist. Yeah, thank you, Marav. <laughs> thank you, Marav. That was amazing. And we got cool gull week t-shirts. But I think it really catalyzed all of these sort of nature-oriented people to go out and look for these types of organisms. And they're beautiful and they're fascinating. And it was the perfect example of how a printed book can still have a big effect on the naturalist community. And just to interject real quick, I, it's also a really good example of some of the other themes we were talking about, where you look at the book, and it's a big book, and there are a lot of species, a lot of a lot of galls covered in the book, but it's still just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much to learn, and as I've said before, galls are probably one of the quickest way to make a discovery new to science that there is in nature right now, at least in North America. And again, coming from vertebrates. I'm not used to having a bunch of organisms in a field guide that are unknown. <laughs> He's got a lot of illustrations of unknown species, undescribed species, and they're in a field guide, but still undescribed. And I think that's really cool. And those are ones that are already photographed. There are plenty out there that are probably not photographed. He's also a really interesting guy too, because I was reading a little bit for this and I had a Hawaiian reefs book that was also by Ron Russo. And I was like, is that the same guy? So apparently his two interests primary interests are plant galls and shark biology. So he's published a bunch of papers on the physiology of leopard sharks. And it kind of makes sense that he's into like reef organisms and galls. Like they're both such strange manifestations of life. Yeah, no idea. Cricket, I'm remembering Ron Russo was at East Bay Regional Parks. Yeah, that's him. Biologist, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And a funny side story on this, University of California Press, they have a really nice series of different guides, field guides, and another naturalist books specific to California. And there was a plant galls book for California that Ron Riso had created, and it was out of print for years. And it was selling until this latest updated, expanded version came out from Princeton Press. I think that old out of print book was sometimes selling for 100 
hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So Alan, yeah. Alan got to tell his field guide story. That was my field guide story. I, I buy too many field guides, especially when they show up in thrift stores or things like that. And they're just pretty and I buy them. So I was in a non-expansionary phase. I was trying so hard not to acquire new books. And I went to the big book sale for the San Francisco Public Library, the one where you can buy books with a shopping cart. It's in a big <laughs> warehouse and you just tool around with your shopping cart and buy books. But I found a copy of that gall guide and I didn't buy it. I was like, no, I'm not buying any more books. And so I didn't take it home with me. And then about a month later, I was like, oh, I really wish I had that golf field guide. And I looked it up and it was selling for 150 bucks. <laughs> so when I, I was so excited when I found out that this one was being published. Yeah, I got to tell you, I, I, I have the old guide. I have that old expensive guide. And I've been seeing the new one thinking, do I need this? I think I need the new one. And I've been reluctant to buy it. But you've explained to me I need to cash in the old one and yeah. buy the new one, which covers all the Western states. and then. I'm in better shape. So yeah, you know, the, the whole, the sorry, the whole issue of, of revised guides or bigger, better, exciting, it's hard. Book addict, but ad, book addiction is, is a really serious affliction. And <laughs> yeah, I admire you for being in a non-expansion phase, but what a hard thing to keep up with. I know. But, yeah. We're not here to give investment advice. So <laughs> Please talk to your financial advisor before investing in the UC Press gall book. I got to tell you, there's a really interesting analog that happened in Raptor World. About 20 years ago, there were a few Raptor guides out, and they were just starting to come out with photo-based guides. And a big guide done by Brian Wheeler, very big book, I think also Princeton University, Princeton Press, and maybe $50 as the cover price. And then there was a huge sweep where a bunch of the environmental consulting firms across the country started working on wind turbine locations. And because wind turbines and, and raptors tend to be um, a little bit diametrically opposed and create a bunch of problems, and those consulting firms needed to train a lot of biologists in raptor identification really fast. Suddenly, the, the Wheeler Guide went from being $50 a copy to being $200, $300 a copy, and, and you cannot find it now because it still has the most photos per species of any bird guide that's out there. So <laughs> it is really interesting, the, the things that drive a sudden increase in a particular book. So you better buy all those books, Cricket, so you have yes. an option on cashing in later, <laughs> right? Yes. That's the excuse I needed. <laughs> well, we, you, I'm talking about field guides because you had a, the interview with Michael Kaufman. Yes. Yeah. So that was in my favorite pile too, is the Field Guide to Manzanitas, which is a beautiful book, beautifully bound, beautifully illustrated. And the a lot of the identification is still a little bit beyond my skill set. I'm not, there's some things I need to learn to identify them like the lichens, but the book is so beautiful. It makes me want to learn. I really want to learn how to identify Manzanitas just to justify such a beautiful book. But he was talking a little bit about the economics of field guide mm -hmm. publications and how so many people are getting out of publishing field guides. Right. It's so sad to me. Uh, so he started Backcountry Press. And yeah. uh, in fact, he has a brand new field guide to, I, I'm going to get the title wrong. I'll have to correct this in the show notes, but it's, it's Plants of the California Desert that just came out. Yeah. Like maybe a week or two ago. Cool. Nice. And the books are beautiful. These are books I would buy just for the, the prettiness. I think uh, I'm going to use your call out of the Manzanita field guide to delve into maybe a couple other topics that I know were on our radar anyway. And one is local guides versus national guides or broader geographies. And, and this is an example of a type of book that you really do need to narrow down the geography to make it useful. And you also have a local expert that makes it all the better. So he adds in county by county listings of what you can find in which county in California and beyond. I think he gets into Oregon maybe as well. And, and Mexico. Yeah. And then not only that, but then there's some, some maps too. It's very specific. And he gives ideas for Manzanita hikes or road trips or things like that. Like a Manzanita road trip. Yeah. <laughs> Alan, how about from your perspective, Cricket brought up a couple really interesting more, uh, maybe more esoteric sorts of field guides. 
Do you have any in your pile that you'd like to talk about? Let's get away from those feathered animals that <laughs> dominate our lives. <laughs> you mean dinosaurs or? <laughs> exactly. They're, they're all dinosaurs. Yeah. Actually, I was thinking about this. So lichens and dragonflies have driven my field guide indulgences the last few years, but two guides that kind of jumped into my head in the last con- part of the conversation. We're the UC Press folks have done some really interesting work along the way. And I have to say, from grade school forward, I've tried to collect all of the UC Press books here and there. One of the interesting ones back in the, I think, the 1980s, and by, a, I think he was teaching community college in the East Bay, a man named Herbert Wong, W-O-N-G, was a book called Field Guide to Vacant Lots. I think Cricket has it right there. I love that. What a great portal. Again, what what a great opportunity to say, you don't have to go to Yosemite. You don't have to go to the Joshua Tree deserts. You can do this in Oakland in in a vacant lot and find some predictable species and exciting species, colorful species that um, are worth looking for. The doc filing goes right to that same place, but the vacant lots book I thought was a wonderful innovation. And something that we should see more of and get more close to. And another one of those cases of an appreciating field guide, if you go and look for it now, I think the prices come down a little bit, but when I first learned about it and I looked for it, it was 80 to to $100. So I think it's pretty desperately in need of republication or revamping. Jack Laws, are you out there? <laughs> the, the Bay Area Vacant Lots Laws Guide. I think there is with iNaturalist and with all of these great sort of inclusive nature movements, I think City city Nature Challenges. City Nature Challenges. I think a a good field guide slash ecology book about urban ecology would be really necessary right now. I think a lot of people would be really interested. I think people are really tuned to what they can see on their street corner. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. And one of the One of the things that really catapulted my interest in nature at large, I've been interested in birds for 15 years plus, and then that led to butterflies and dragonflies. Whenever I would see anything else interesting, I'd always take a photo and I would use bug guide or something. And, you know, so I was learning a little bit here and there, but I really got focused at the start of the pandemic by just looking in my backyard. And and very quickly, I realized that I would be able to easily see uh, a new species a day on average, you know, if not more for my tiny little, not well landscaped backyard in South San Jose. And when I started telling that story to people, I, I volunteer at an open space authority, even at work, I worked at Google, it's a bunch of engineers. But when I tell the story of what I discovered in my own yard and showed them a few photos, I could really see the connection starting to form for people. So I, I 100% agree. We need one of these guides. And speaking of urban stuff, I'm just going to show one that I bought out of partly interest, partly because I just want to learn more. But I bought this book here. I don't know if you can see it. Urban Lichens. But it's for Northeastern North America. Uh, I guess I'm also countering the West Coast bias that we've had so far. But it talks about urban lichens in Boston and New York and Chicago, which is really interesting. And it's an interesting approach along the lines of what the Gall book did to help open people's eyes to things that may just be right there in front of them. That's a really hard challenge for me is when you see a great book. And I think there was a recent moth guide that came out for the Eastern United States and thinking, oh God, if it just said West instead of East, I would (laughs) spend $80 on that thing. But yeah, the Urban Lichen Guide, I noticed that one too, and I just couldn't quite spring for it. I'd like to check your copy out of the Michael Hawk Library. <laughs> I was going to mention too, one of the one of the UC Press books, I am a, an absolute inept herpetology person. It's just an area I've never, ever gotten into, but I love the idea of horned lizards. They just are tiny little dinosaurs of huge personality, and UC Press at one point did a Field Guide to Horned Lizards of North America. It's got 13 species in it, (laughs) all within one genus. And it's it's all based on photos. I could stand to have a few painted plate pages would have been great. It's 170 pages dedicated to 13 species in one genus. And and for me, that's a, this is maybe jumping in ahead, but that's a future of incredibly wonderful field guides is a, a deep incorporating Michael, what you were getting at, more of the total ecology, conservation, biology, habitat relationships, pollination. There's so many interspecies relationships that each species could be hooked to. And this is where that guide goes. 
So maybe it's not so much a field guide, but to dedicate so much space to a lay person point of view on one genus of horned lizard is, it, I love it. It's a beautiful little book. And I'd love to see more of that happen as specialists evolve in our community of ecologists and taxonomists and natural historians. And that's also a really interesting maybe feature of what makes a field guide a field guide and not a reference book is that it should generally be accessible to amateurs. That, for example, if you pick up a lichen book, you might need to learn some terminology, but it should be useful even if you don't, that you should be able to sort of see some patterns and learn some things and be able to use it without a whole lot of technical jargon or that kind of thing. So it's geared towards someone who's learning, maybe, and someone who's not a professional and, and not doesn't have super deep knowledge. Or for a, a range of people, some who are beginners and some who are not. Or owns a microscope. <laughs> or the <laughs> microscope. Oh my goodness. So I just saw this on, on the top of my favorite pile too. It was a field guide that I wanted to talk about was All That the Rain Promises and More by David oh, yeah. Carter, which I think does something that I've never seen in another field guide, which is it's a pocket guide to Western mushrooms. So it's a very truncated guide to mushrooms, which is really complicated and sometimes difficult to ID group. But he's got all of these little vignettes about mushroom people little colorful stories about people foraging or people having mushroom parties or people selling mushrooms or commercial pickers. So it does this thing that I've never seen in a field guide, but it would be if you had a bird guide that also talked about birders, you know, that talked about bird festivals and Audubon societies and all that kind of stuff. So it gave this sense of, okay, so you're interested in mushrooms. Here's why it's fun to be a person who's interested in mushrooms. And the cover is amazing. So the cover is a man holding, I think it's Chicken of the Woods, and he's in a tuxedo with a little fruffy <laughs> shirt, and he's got like a wispy mustache and a trumpet. I don't know why, but which is maybe my favorite field guide cover ever. Like, I just want to know more about it. So that that was the thing I liked about that one, particularly. Is it's just, it's fun. It's super fun. It has a lot of character. I still chuckle when I see that cover. Every time. I love it. It makes me so happy. Cricket, I, yeah, I thought immediately you were going to go to it's humorous and it's, right. it's light. And it's, yeah, I'm sure you guys are tuned in too. There's, there's a variety of scientific illustrators now who are publishing online. And the cartoon False Knees comes to mind that are incredibly lovely scientific illustrations, but put into a cartoon fashion to be funny and droll and picking at high standards of respectable biology. And it's an awesome time right now to have everybody acknowledge that this stuff is, it ultimately it's fun. It's life affirming and engaging in a way. And to take all of this species identification stuff down a notch so that we can realize our, our human weirdness in all of it is, it's a really lovely trend right now. I find I have to be really careful because I tend to make fun of birders and especially raptor people who are so dedicated but there's a lot of humor in it ultimately there's a level of scientific documentation and work that needs to be done but there's also an incredibly sweet and hilarious side to all this work that's it's really fun to be playful and fun to let that part out so cricket thanks for bringing that up no exactly that's the word actually that exactly came to mind when you were talking was playfulness that there's a lot of playfulness creeping back in. And I feel like the iNaturalist community does a pretty good job of this, like bio blitzes, right? It's a bunch of grownups going to a park and basically being kids playing in a creek. Like, oh, look at the bug I found. Look at this snake. Like, have you seen this snake? Look at this cool thing. I love that playfulness is there and that sort of child, the wonder and the curiosity. And that's like field guides. That's what you do when it's rainy and you look like thumbing through your field guide. Like, oh, look at that thing. What? Did you see this thing? I want to go find that thing. And it's all of this curiosity, just like you said, it's a lot of having fun and being kids in the creek. That just gave me an idea for a new type of field guide, actually. So you said field guide, just like what you do when it's raining. But actually, we should be out looking for the, the organisms that only come out in the rain when it's raining. <laughs> we need a field guide yeah. to organisms of the rain. <laughs> oh, like tiger salamanders. Yeah. What you can see when it's pouring rain. Yeah. We'll get back to some books here in a minute, but as promised earlier, Let's talk about some of the new digital resources that are out there. And I say digital resources because there's like just such a huge array of options. There are apps, there are websites, and maybe to kick it off, I'm going to mention one that I really enjoy, and that is Charlie Iceman's Field Guide to Leaf Miners 
which is a uh, PDF that you can purchase from him. And you get monthly updates from him as he makes new discoveries or as the community makes new discoveries. So I found that to be really innovative and and more comprehensive than you could ever get in a book. I think right now it's up to something like 1,800 pages, uh, something like that. So that's been a really unique digital form field guide that shows both the power of the medium. It, it enables people to create in new ways and new formats that there was a significant barrier to entry for previously. So with that, which direction, who wants to jump in with with their favorite digital resources? Oh, I can. So I mean, iNaturalist is the obvious one in terms of IDing species and keeping lists and stuff like that. I tend not to use apps that much. I do have the Sibley on my phone and I find I use that now because I always have it on me and it has some really nice features like being able to compare species. It has a split screen function where you can put one bird on top and the other bird on top and you can change the plumages or the, or the sexes. And I really like that one. I know a lot of people use Merlin. I don't really use Merlin. Do you guys? I don't. Yeah, I really haven't. It has some really nice features like packs for different regions. So you don't have to get a whole new app if you're going to Columbia or something. You can just download the Columbia pack. And I know it has some audio recognition now. So you can try to ID songs. But maybe I'm too old school. But People seem to really like Merlin. If I could just add a note on that, like I, I admit I haven't looked at Merlin closely in a while, so it may have progressed much beyond you know, the last time I looked at it. I think it has. I think that's been my experience. It's like I put it on my phone and it wasn't that useful to me, but I think it's gone leaps and bounds in yeah. the way that iNaturalist has. If you looked at iNet five years ago, it's a totally different place than it is now in terms of how the AI is trained and things like that. Yeah, and it's going to continue to grow, you know, exponentially. Just the nature of AI is so that's what it does. And I was just going to say one other thing about Merlin. The other thing I think that has kept me from using Merlin too much is I installed this app called BirdNet a couple of years ago. It's only on Android, last I saw, and it's also an audio recognition app. And I found that to be very beneficial for me, and it prevented me from you know, having any sort of desire to seek out any other audio recognition app. That's another one to look at from a bird ID standpoint. I'm pretty old school too. Books are where I'd like to go, but there are definitely some wonderful avenues. I mentioned before bugguide.net, which I appreciate both because it's great to open up a page that's all the buprested beetles and the, the fact that you get just, a, I love the explosion of photographs of one genus or one species, I, that's just an incredibly wonderful thing. I use Google Images a lot for that as well. Going back to the idea of variation, that it's really hard to express in a book form 800 species of birds with variation on all those birds. You'd, you'd be looking at thousands and thousands of pages in many volumes. So to be able to go to Google Images and put in something like Buick's Wren, and there's some variation in Buick's Wren, and getting to see all of that in 50 photographs and then shifting through that and looking and looking. There's a lot of educational opportunities there that, that I use a lot. And so it's not as fine-tuned as an app, but it works. Recently, I was uh, walking in Berkeley and heard a wren that I had never heard before. And I'm not very good at house wren calls. I'm like a Buick's wren, Pacific wren. I can do those. This was really fluty and liquid in a way that sounded really wrong. Ran back home, put on a YouTube house wrens, and I scrolled through YouTube house wrens for probably an hour. And I'm pretty convinced that's what I was listening to. But also there's that problem of the internet for me, and maybe this is less about apps, but, but I think it, it works through the apps too. We don't often think about geographic variation. And often there's a placelessness that happens where you don't always see that this is a house run from California as opposed to a house run from Massachusetts. And that for me is one of the most interesting part of all these animals is that there's these variations. What's a species today may get split tomorrow and may be analyzed in a different way. I feel like the internet is changing rapidly and just what you both have said about INAT and Merlin, I need to go back and explore those a little bit more depth. But I love the sort of wiki approach that INET has and bugguide.net have that I can be engaged in a conversation over time on photographs and animals that I'm seeing or plants that I'm seeing. To me, that's super exciting and the, the possibilities are pretty endless. I love learning about new possibilities in this area. Yeah, and the persistence is nice too. As the AI gets better, 
your observations are all recorded there. I'm sure you guys have had this experience on Bug Eyed or on iNet of having something that you posted three years ago and someone just happens to be combing through it and it turns out to be something really interesting, which is cool that you could just park it there and mm -hmm. wait for someone to come along and find it. Do you, do you guys know what Timema, T-I-M-E-M-A is? It's a genus of bug. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's actually a walking stick. Ooh. You think of a walking stick as this fabulous leggy thing that's in some tropical forest and moving really slowly and freezing and you think it's stick. There's a, a whole bunch of Western U.S. walking sticks that are about an inch long mm -hmm. and they look almost like green earwigs. They're really pretty well understood as far as individual species ranges go. I will find like one Tamima in Berkeley or in the Sierra Nevada about every five years. My learning curve is really slow. So <laughs> it's really exciting to get to take a photograph of these inverts because they're so, they're slow. that I, They're easy to capture. And then have had the same experience that somebody has called me up three years later and said, oh my God, you have these on your redwood tree in Berkeley? And I'm like, I had one three years ago. <laughs> don't, don't ask me to go find it again. But right. you know, just the fact that you get to insert that little bit of data into the data bank and there's someone who actually knows what your photo is right. super that's thrilling that's great stuff yeah and i just wanted to put one plug in here for a resource that i was using a lot lately which is the sea slugs of hawaii <laughs> but oh, it's Corey pittman and pauline fine i think but this is where the digital can be really good this is probably not you might be able to publish a book on it it's so wonderful like i recommend going there just because the organisms are so beautiful there are these gorgeous nudibranchs and sea slugs. And it's good because the thing that's a little tough sometimes about iNaturalist is if you have a bunch of undescribed species that are recognized as individual species but not described yet, that are in the same genus, iNet doesn't do a good job of distinguishing them. It's kind of hard to filter out for this unknown species, number one, and unknown species, number two. Like, for example, there was a sea slug that I saw in Hawaii, and it was the genus Tenelia. And it was the 27th unknown species of Tenelia. So there are 27 recognized species that are all undescribed. Hmm. And the nice thing about this resource, as people find new species, then you can just add them very quickly and then you can have the photos right up there. So that was a really good resource in a place where, for example, the iNaturalist AI wasn't very well trained. So I couldn't put those photos up and have iNaturalist recognize them because it just didn't have enough information. So I could go to this digital resource and then correspond with the person and that's also the nice thing is that there's someone you can talk to. You can't necessarily call up Sibley and tell him about your bird you saw. Well, Alan probably can. Alan probably can. He doesn't take my calls. <laughs> I do have a funny Sibley story. It, it's slightly bird identification related. About 20 years ago, I was going to be a TA on a bird trip to Veracruz, where the biggest raptor migration happens in the entire world. It was fall migration here at Gold Gate. I was racing to get out of town. And there was an American Red Start hanging out up at the Hawk Hill site that all the hot birders were coming around from the Bay Area to see this American Red Start. And I, I knew I had about three hours of work to condense into an hour before I raced down to San Francisco airport to get on a plane to Mexico City. And I, I thought, I just don't have time for this. And I got on the plane. I went down to Mexico City, took a puddle jumper over the hill to Veracruz, got to the Hawk Watch site at Veracruz, who should be there but David Sibley? And I had never met David Sibley. And he said, hi, nice to meet you. His second line was, did you get the American Red Star? I became about two inches tall as I, real I realized that I might as well have said, am not a real birder across my forehead. And that was my introduction to Mr. Sibley. So um, he didn't seem to hold it against me, but I felt like I was um, pretty small at that point. For for what it's worth, over the last like year, I have really gotten away from chasing the rarities. So to me, it's nothing lost in that. You had other priorities. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but I'm not David Sibley. So uh, I, I was going to mention a bit ago when in Cricket, you were talking about the sea slugs of Hawaii. It reminded me of this other website called gall formers. We were talking about plant yes. galls before, and it's yes. kind of the same thing. It's a repository for all the undescribed species and the host relationships and things like that. And you can email them, hop on Twitter to interact with them, or even through INAT. So it's a really nice resource that's filling in those gaps. Yeah. And I think there, someone from gall formers is actually going through the INAT observations and finding a way to collate all of those unknown species into one searchable so that you can search for things and it's not just all in genus. Adam Krantz from Golf Formers was on the podcast last year 
And that turned out to be a surprisingly popular episode. I think it just goes to show the popularity of plant galls at the moment. Yeah. And I think that book was instrumental in that. I don't think it would have happened without a handy field guide. All right. Why don't we zoom through some other quick lightning round recommendations? How about a most recent field guide purchase that you've made? My most recent was, and I was trying to, I unfortunately don't have the authors in my head, but it was, uh, it's a bumblebee guide that came out about 2014. I love it because, again, going back to the idea of it, it deeply explores a small group of insects. To me, it goes back to something Cricket mentioned earlier in the show about pattern formation and enough patterning that you can, you feel like you can actually start to absorb it by osmosis and experience into your brain, and you might have a chance at seeing it. And although it's got photos in it and a few illustrations, again, back to the idea of patterning, there's a few guides that have done something that I'm excited about, which is to create almost a geometrical representation of a bird or a bug, and then quite uh, abstractedly thinking about a bumblebee's back and looking at the head markings and the abdomen markings and the thorax markings as they wrap around the bug. And then you get yellows and blacks in different patterns and showing those in a kind of almost geometric format. I'm really fascinated by that. And I'll just admit to you late at night, I've drawn geometric raptors (laughs) to show where the lights and darks are. And I've been doing that for years and playing with that. I've never really exposed the the Raptor Observatory faithful to it because I'm not quite there yet. But years ago, I was co-teaching a class on hawks. And my teacher, who is a person I'd known for 10 years, I was talking about the vividness of the red-shouldered hawk rust color, the rufous color in the chest. And George said to me, and he said, I've never seen that color. And I said, what do you mean you've studied raptors for a decade? He said, I'm colorblind. I see strictly lights and darks. And I look at the black and white tail pattern to see a red-shouldered hawk. And then also shape. And then we started talking about shape. And he taught me things that I had never looked at because I used color as a crutch. (laughs) So I'm really fascinated by how different people perceive in different modes. And really interested in as you narrow down a kind of uh, patterning on a species moving away from pretty pictures, but toward a geometry of pattern. How far can you go to reduce those to a particular color scheme and look? And there's an artist recently whose work I haven't seen, but who's taken bird plumages, say rose-breasted grosbeak, and just done them as a bar graph stack in the different colors that are featured in that particular species, say, as an adult male. And I'm really excited by that. There's something interesting about that reduction distillation of patterns in animals that I think is super interesting. So I just wanted to comment on the Bumblebee books. It's called Bumblebees of North America by Williams, Thorpe, Richardson, and Cola. And I had it sitting on my desk here because I have a love-hate relationship with this book. For some of the same reasons you mentioned, I like the the pattern abstractions. And they basically, as you said, break down the B into a bunch of little segments with different colorations, and they can also then compare the variants among a given species, or male and female for that matter. The reason why I said a love-hate relationship is you walk away from it thinking it's very understandable and that you should be able to identify everything that you see until you get in the field, of course, and, and you realize how complicated bumblebees are. And then when you look a little bit more closely, that each species account has a microscopic characteristics section too, which really should have been the clue that (laughs) that you probably won't really be able to identify (laughs) to species. Anyway, so that's my story of bumblebees of North America. I I like the book. I do recommend it. So Cricket, uh, recent field guide purchase. Okay. So I had two. So I was recently down in the desert. So I got the field guide to desert holes. Oh, so cool. Wow. (laughs) Which is, I got for novelty purpose, but is actually really cool. Because in a place like a desert, where obviously temperature and heat is a problem, lots of animals use holes and shelter underground. So it's really cool to be able to tell something about what kind of creature just from a hole in the ground. Do you have to put your hand in the hole? I think that's probably not highly recommended, (laughs) but I haven't gone through all the book yet. (laughs) And then the other one I got was Harmless Snakes of the West. Well, I love snakes, and I also thought it was a great title. So Cricket, you're taking this like to... uh 
entirely new level. I, so many books now are on my list. I'm going to have to put a warning, I think, at the beginning of this episode. Take care when listening because you may be out a few hundred dollars by the end of this episode. It's so tempting. And it's, that was one I, I, I hadn't come across those before. And I just happened to be in a desert where the, the visitor centers were very desert oriented. And how could I not buy Harmless Snakes of the West? It is a great title. I like it, too. How about, does anything come to mind as a most esoteric or niche field guide that you own? We've hit a few, I think, uh, like some of these here, I think would meet that criteria. (laughs) (laughs) I have a couple. Actually, they're probably, interestingly enough, the field guides that I use most in the field that probably have the least amount of commercial appeal. And one is a a coast field guide to beached birds by Mm -hmm. Todd Hass and Julia Parrish, which is actually a really beautiful book. So it has really thick pages so you can take it on the beach. So this is specifically for identifying dead birds that you find washed up on the beach, which can be a mess. So they have all these really interesting features like silhouettes. So the other one I have is the beached marine birds and mammals of the North American West Coast. Which again, this is probably not a coffee table book. Like, I don't think anyone's gonna buy this for aesthetic values. I don't think anyone wants to look through a bunch of photographs of dead birds, but They have all of these outlines of feet and of bills so that you can actually take the bill of a bird that you find on the beach and match it up onto the book, which is really cool. That's not a feature that's going to be useful for many things, but it's an actual size outline of feet and of bills and of sternums. I, you can, like I said, especially if you have three cormorants or something, right? Three species of cormorants that are pretty common. And then you have the outlines of bills. So even if it's not identifiable by plumage, you can just line up the bill right on the page. That's really creative. Which is what I like about these books is, like I said, they're not anybody's idea of what a beautiful field guide looks like in terms of the illustrations, but they have all of this really cool information, abundance, what time of year are you likely to find this? They have all kinds of measurements, like rulers integrated into the book. So in terms of like how you design a field guide and what kind of tools you can put into the physical book, I think they're really interesting examples. Alan, any other esoteric field guides that spring to mind for you? Yeah, I have two things jump to mind. One is that there's a series that I only have the bird one in my head, but the title is Bird Tracks and Signs. And I believe there's one on mm. insects and one on mammals as well. And Michael's going to pull his copy forward. <laughs> I know, I feel like I should have mine. We got to do this in person next time. Yeah. I love that. I love the series. Yeah. There seems to be a trend right now in nature books toward going beyond tracks, looking for evidence of, of anything from beetle, beetle chews in trees to places that, that pileated woodpeckers have been excavating, just a whole range of stuff that talk about how you might recognize those things. And it's, I'm fascinated by it because I think it's partly also that the kind of intergenerational transfer of knowledge that we might have gotten 100 years ago when we walked with grandma down the down through the aspen forest and she would say look that's where a black bear scratched and you would get that information and you would pass it on and um, that kind of stuff those those outdoor word of mouth grandparent to grandchild things that kind of information is disappearing and so to get some of it into books as coarse and not necessarily as specific as it could be to your own particular habitat is really exciting to me that more of that stuff is coming out. And it's not a replacement for time in the field with someone who knows more than you do. When people tell me they want to learn raptors, I say, find someone who knows more than you do and spend time outside with them. That's the best field guide there is. I I think that's a trend that I'm really liking right now. And again, being new to insects, the insect material is really exciting to me because it's opening up my brain to and eyes to whole areas that I hadn't really thought about. Yeah, tracks and sign of insects and other invertebrates. That was an eye opener for me when it came out. And also, that's Charlie Eisman again. And uh, oh, really? Oh, neat. I didn't know. Noah Charney is the co-author. Speaking of esoteric, uh, chapter in the book is so it's tracks and sign. So sign could be anything. It could be chew marks or pupa or whatever the case might be. But they have a chapter about bites. There's actually photos of what a bite might look like from d- different insects. Very different. I love that because anytime somebody gets a bite of any kind in my family, yeah. it is proclaimed to be a spider bite. And I, I feel like spider bite is the biggest cop out in the world. It's just, it's too easy to say. And which spider are we talking about? It To me, it's like one of those. I have no clue. 
but we're going to call it a spider bite because that's so sometimes those <laughs> family lineage diagnoses are not necessarily spot on either. So true. Yeah. Have either of you seen, there, there was an incredible guide on field guide to grasshoppers and crickets of the United States that came out about 10, 15 years ago. And the author is Capinera, John Capinera, C-A-P-I-N-E-R-A. And the I've struggled to try and figure those the orthopterans are um, just, they're so primitive and they're so bizarre and they look like piles of granite shoved into an insect form. And then they fly and they have these butterfly colored wings that just are stunning for a second and you try and catch them, but they're really hard to catch and they're way smarter than I am. Just the range of brutal looking animals with magnificent craggy beauty is really thrilling to me. I was extraordinarily fortunate recently. There was a grasshopper on my property in my yard. And uh, for some reason, it didn't care about me. It didn't fly away when, even like when my shadow went over, a lot of times that, you know, they'll take off. So as is often the case, I had my macro camera with me all ready to go. So I laid down flat on the ground and got as close to it as I could and got this wonderful head-on shot of this grasshopper that your description of it's like granite, squeezed or forced into some sort of you know insect exoskeleton that, that that's perfect and my god the size of those mandibles oh, <laughs> yeah i'll have to include that photo i'm sure there's better ones out there but this is my photo so i'm going to include it you get to do that yeah. i'd love to see that that would be i saw, yeah i saw you posted that on instagram i did yeah that's a great photo okay i'm going to give both of you one more shout out to a field guy that you didn't get to talk about Cricket, you ready? Uh, <laughs> it's like you're reaching for one. I was, I was trying to see if I think I've I think I've actually covered all of them, or the ones that I had in my pile anyway. All right, I'm gonna give you a different question then, because you don't get off that easily. We talked about a few missing field guides in the course of the discussion. What would you like to see? And I'm gonna first of all say we need a dock fouling field guide. So mm -hmm. I, I hope you're working on that. <laughs> Not yet, but that's fun. <laughs> I think we could also combine the question a little bit too. I think you had asked earlier about field guides that we're excited about, that we're excited about being published. So what I desperately want for California or for the Western United States is a field guide to snails and slugs. So terrestrial gastropods are not terribly well covered. I don't know of any field guide that really covers them and certainly not in a comprehensive way. There's some like illustrated checklists, but then it's just basically a page of 45 snail shells that all look exactly alike. But I've heard that Barry Roth is working on one. So supposedly in the works, there is a snails of the Western United States that's in the works. And I'm super excited about that one. And I think also a Liam O'Brien's butterfly guide that I think we've all been waiting, waiting with bated breath for that to be published. So that talking of beautiful illustrations, mm. he's making all those beautiful illustrations of butterflies. And I can't wait to see that one. And I recently saw a post that he had done about the different gender of the genders of the butterflies and how the male is always more prominently displayed and the female is always shoved in the corner and described as drabbed. He said in this post that he's making a conscious decision to foreground the female of the species and or at least give them equal weight as the males which is also another issue with field guides that always there's the big beautiful indigo bunting and oh here's the little female over here so i thought that was a really interesting move on his part and i'm more excited now to see that book published because of that decision or at least that sensitivity that he has oh, yeah and you just think objectively about the purpose of a field guide why not like you're gonna see as many female of some organism as you will uh, a male so yeah absolutely okay. and then alan your one last pass on another guide i was gonna go somewhere else but i saw that posting from liam too and he's a wonderfully eclectic and interesting lepidoptera thinker and i've really appreciated being out in the field with him and learning from him i was intrigued by that because um what he's really saying is that field guides as they exist right now are a real product of a whole sort of structure and culture of science. And to acknowledge that field guides carry cultural and social justice weight and information and bias is a really exciting thing. There's really an important time happening right now in science and conservation biology and access to science and who gets to describe it. I suspect that both of you we're listening carefully in the last two years as the discussion of who should get an animal named after them mm -hmm. and why 
should you get a bird named after you because you were the person who shot it 300 years ago and it happened to end up at a museum? The, the whole idea of honorific names is really interesting. And for me, it bears into the same area of what are species names all about and how do we apply them and how do we recognize the immense cultural bias that has gone into establishing those names over the last hundreds of years without necessarily pointing at a field guide. I think there's a super interesting conversation happening broadly about where species guides and species names are being challenged and rethought about what they mean and how they're presented. And I've been lucky lately to be asked to present at some indigenous conferences and with a community of people. One of these was up in the Yurok Nation and to be with people who've been on their land for three to 5,000 years, and they have names for stuff, and they don't show up in my Sibley, and they don't show up in the field guides that we're talking about, and they're not given the recognition that of age and often ecological relationships and the depth of information that might be contained within those. So for us to start to relax the cultural and social impositions that field guides have been contained in for the last 30, 40 years, hundred years and see a kind of blooming of a broader a landscape of those aspects, I think is really exciting. And I wish I had a book I could point to in that respect, but I, I don't think that book has been out yet or that I've seen. So I think we're looking at a time where imagine that sea slugs of Hawaii with all of the names and acknowledgements of as many indigenous stories that could be told about those sea slugs could be out in the world would be really exciting. That was all so well said. Like I, I've been thinking about things I can say to amplify or so forth. My short little comment a moment ago about what's the purpose of these guides for talking about identification. It makes sense that you want a guide that helps people identify things. The second layer, the naming layer, that's such a big topic, you know, in and of itself. And when I hear people that are complaining or upset about the name changes that uh, have been proposed or enacted. I really, too much engineering me, I think. I always go back to first principles and I'm like, really, if you were designing this system, this is what you would have chosen? <laughs> you would have right. you know, chosen to name it after McCown or whoever. I'll prevent myself from going on a soapbox diatribe. To wrap things up then, I'd like to give both of you a chance to highlight any projects or upcoming work or anything that you'd like to point people at. It could also be your website or social media. So Cricket, why don't you take it away? Okay, most of my uh, online presence is social media stuff. So I'm Chili Possum, C-H-I-L-I -I, Possum, uh, on Instagram and on iNaturalist. And iNaturalist is where I spend most of my time these days. And if I could also just put in a quick work plug, for people in the Bay Area who are also iNaturalist users, if you're ever walking on the beaches and you come across stranded marine mammals, dead ones especially, if you could post those on iNaturalist, it's really helpful for us in terms of building a database. And we also have someone who combs the iNaturalist looking for those observations. So that's my work plug. I, I snuck in there. But yeah, iNat and Instagram mostly. Just a quick question on the iNat thing. So they, they comb observations looking for this, but is there a way to make it easier? Is there a project or anything that they can tag or a person? You can tag me. So you can tag me at Chili Possum and then I can either deal with it myself or, or hand it off to a person who knows. But if you're in the Bay Area, there's not so many observations that we would miss them. We will see them, but it's really helpful if, if those get posted. And even if it's something that you think has been seen before, you know, it's really useful for like persistence and stuff like that, that we know that it's still there. And how about Ellen? Yeah, I'll just close up around. One of the things I love about this conversation is I've been, I've been really fortunate to work in the Marin Headlands for almost 40 years and the privilege of getting to be in one place and see the biology and the plants and animal species changing and finding new things and learning new things, even outside of the raptor migration is wonderful. Some of the most incredible work that's being done in natural history is not being done by paid people, it's being done by people who are committed to a, what the Brits call a patch, that you go to a patch, whether it's a dock or the Marin Headlands or a pond, that you go to a patch a lot, as many times a week as you can, and you keep data on it and put it into INAT and take photographs where you don't know something. Patch natural history, even, and maybe especially in an urban area, 
I think is super important. I don't know if there's a national or even international resource on that, but there should be. The Raptor Observatory is the Golden Gate Raptor Observatory. We have a 40-year database on the raptor migration through the Menhevlins, which work as a population trend tool for understanding changes in hawks, eagles, falcons, vultures, kites, harriers, osprey populations. And you can find us online at ggro.org. The Raptor Observatory is part of the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, which has a variety of community science projects from bees to bats to wildlife picture indexes. And the Raptor Observatory is part of the family or suite of projects. We're currently setting up for the fall migration 2022. Although we had some limitations, how we operated the hawk count in 2021 and 2020. Everybody is available, always welcome to come up to Hawk Hill for the peak of fall migration, which is September, October, November every year. And the big secret at at Hawk Hill is that it's way more than hawks. It's not just the birds of prey, but we have some of the most magnificent swift and swallow flights, band-tailed pigeon flights, variegated meadowhawk migrations, just a lot of really interesting stuff going past us in the sky, as well as cetaceans and pinnipeds down in the Golden Gate. So just a lot of stuff to see from this beautiful vantage point in the middle of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. Look us up online and feel free to contact us if you have questions. And I'm embarrassed to admit that I've yet to get to go there. I have the like mental block of driving through the city mm-hmm. <laughs> that far. I'm way down in the <laughs> South Bay. I'm in South San Jose. So it's a pretty good trek to get up there. I thought you were going to say you had a mental block because being Michael Hawk on Hawk Hill is just too predictable. <laughs> and you have to defy, you have to defy predictability somewhere. I, I just can't take the puns anymore. So that's right. the real reason. <laughs> I did just realize when you were talking about this, that we talked about field guides to hawks and to crickets, but not a field guide to fish. So ah. <laughs> oh no, we missed that. All right. So I, I guess with that terrible joke, that's <laughs> probably enough for today. That maybe is a signal that we're done. Thank you both for making the time for going way over time. I, I guess I should have seen that coming, knowing the topic that we had and the enthusiasm that you all have for it. So thank you again. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, it was super fun. Yeah, it's been terrific. I learned a lot. I've got a whole page of books to buy. Thank you, Cricket. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for sticking through the entire episode. If you made it this far, I hope that it means that you enjoyed it. If so, please spread the word and share this episode with three friends or groups that you think would enjoy it too. As for today's episode, let me know. Did I miss anything? Was there a topic I should have covered? Let me know at podcast at jumpstartnature.com or DM me on any of my social accounts. I'll do my best to answer your questions. You can find me at Nature's Archive, one word, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I also share photography, nature stories, and much more on those accounts, so you can follow just to stay in touch too. And despite being called crazy by numerous friends and colleagues, last year I left my tech career behind to start Jumpstart Nature, which Nature's Archive is now part of. For the sake of myself, my family, and the planet, I need to make this work. So please also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash jumpstartnature. I offer some exclusive content and perks, and you can start donations as low as $4 a month. Lastly, please also check out our latest creation. It's the Jumpstart Nature podcast. We just completed our pilot season, where each episode reveals an unseen, surprising, or misunderstood nature topic with the help of experts and our host, Griff Griffith. It's entertaining and inspiring, and even reached number three on the Apple Nature podcast charts. There's much more on our roadmap, but we need your support, so check out jumpstartnature.com for more details. Thank you. Thank you.